Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we have a very special episode with guests who talk about the importance of God and country. Lee Greenwood is a Grammy-winning singer, author, writer, and musician with numerous number one hits. His self-penned song, titled God Bless the USA, has been voted the most recognizable patriotic song in America. We caught up with Lee by phone to talk about his faith, his career, and the song that became one of our country's most beloved anthems. This is Lee Greenwood, author, entertainer, writer, singer, musician, live in Nashville, Tennessee, and a country touring artist. I sang in the First Baptist Church probably from the age of 10 to about 14, 15. I also loved singing at church. I think I gained great uh, ear training from my harmonies. Um, and I loved going on Wednesday nights instead of Sundays because Saturday nights I was usually working very late, even in high school. And Wednesdays I would have the fellowship uh, uh, with BYU, so it was, it was, it was kind of cool. My grandmother had said to me when I was about 12 or 13, when she realized I was being creative and writing music, if I was to proceed and have a career in music, and we didn't know at that time if I would, it was just I was a working musician. Um, and she said, if you're ever going to be known for something, make sure it's something that you're proud of. So my career, when it started in Nashville, at MCA, we were signed with Barbara Mandrell and Reba McIntyre, George Strait, and the Oak Ridge Boys. We all had interesting careers that expanded in different ways. I took the avenue, I guess, that they gave me, and that was, I felt that my delivery of a, of a song was sincere, and they gave me these songs. I mean, Jerry Crutchfield, my producer, and I picked them all out over the 18 years I was there that really lend itself best to the quality of my voice and how I could deliver them. And they were generally about relationships and hardships and crisis and, and things that people believe because uh, of the way that I deliver them. I never thought along the way that there would be some song I just wrote because I felt I needed to would become the lasting song of my career. And there were, you have to realize there were five or six albums that I had before I ever wrote God Bless the USA. There were all that produced 11 or 12 number one hits, country songs, and I toured with every country act in the business. And so when I wrote God Bless USA, it was just another one of those songs I was adding to my discography at MCA. But it became apparent later on, uh, when the song was chosen by Universal to be a single release, that it became um, the most powerful moment in my performance and all my shows. And so that became a focal point after of course, uh, Katrina, the Gulf War, and the attack on America in 2001, then became even more of a military anthem um, and, a, and a way to unite, it, to unite the country. And that's the way I had intended it from the very beginning, mm -hmm. was a song to unite Americans. I never intended God Bless USA to be a military anthem. It was merely telling the story of an American. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was kind of surprised, to tell you the truth. I mean, it, it obviously hit the... Hit the uh, the target with the public. God Bless the USA went far beyond what Greenwood expected when he wrote it on the back of his tour bus in 1983. His desire in writing the song was to promote unity in our country and keep patriotism alive. That desire has carried on into a new book for children that Lee has authored called Proud to be an American, which teaches kids and families about patriotism. Our book is, uh, is called Proud to be an American. Mm -hmm which is kind of a second reference to my song, God Bless the USA, and it is the lyrics uh, of the song, but made with childlike illustrations mm -hmm. that a very small child finds fascinating because we had it tested in, uh, in numerous families, and, and that's what they grasped. So in it, uh, of course, are pictures of, of me growing up and, and the places that I visited across this wonderful country. I think family is important. I, I, when I find somebody that has no support of a family, I tend to levitate toward them to give them some security, a feeling of security. But if you have family, um, you need to trust in that strength and, and protect your family and make sure that you do what's right for your senior citizens as they grow older. And it takes more than a parent to raise a child. So if you have somebody around you that is struggling raising children, help them. Uh, that gives you a sense of pride as well, that you helped a young man or young girl develop into adulthood. Faith gives strength. 
um, you have to know as, as a young boy, particularly growing up, that there's something stronger than your father. You have to know there's something stronger there that can protect you when you're uh, in harm's way or in crisis. And I think that's what I've lived by uh, since I became a, a born-again Christian through my wife. And that, that's the kind of faith that I always have, no matter where I perform, no matter what, what kind of disaster or crisis I may face. And, uh, and there's, a, there's, there's a story that you're either coming out of a storm, you're living one, or you're about to have one. And, uh, and if you live by the faith, you're not afraid uh, of that storm. One of the reasons I wrote the book, God Bless the USA, or Proud to be an American, was because less and less family per capita has a soldier in their family. And so that's how we got our lessons from patriotism, is by the men and women who served in our family. It made you more reverent and more love for the country. And uh, as we move forward, of course, that gets less and less because the numbers, it's just a number game. We're with a group called Helping a Hero out of Houston, and their website is helpingahero.org, and we've built over 160 homes in, in 22 states in eight years uh, for these, uh, these soldiers that have paid a tremendous price to keep terrorism off our shores. So because I've sort of become a hero for them, I wanted to have a book that teaches patriotism to children. And we read to our kids when they were a year and, and, and up to four or five years old when they're reading to us. And, and one of the lessons we actually regretted we did not have a book was to teach the lesson of patriotism. What does it mean to be a patriot? So in the very back of the book, I wrote a de dedication, and I'll read it to you. I dedicate this book to Jesus Christ for his never-ending grace. Uh, to Kim, my beautiful wife, who continues to teach me the true meaning of love. To our sons, Dalton and Parker, who show honor to this family and their country and everything they just say and do. And my grandparents, who taught me the wrong from right and gave me the chance to find my destiny. And last but not least, our military that sacrifices beyond measure for the freedoms we enjoy every day. So as we move toward the 4th of July, and today is a special day for America as we celebrate our freedom, may this be a lasting message to everyone who believes in our country. For more information on Lee Greenwood's new book for children, Proud to be an American, please visit LeeGreenwood.com. And to find out how you can be a part of helping to provide wounded veterans with specially adapted homes, please visit HelpingAHero.org. Next, on the Jesus Calling podcast, we are pleased to re-air a segment with country music icon Charlie Daniels. A musician, a man of faith, and a patriot, Charlie has written a book about his life called Never Look at the Empty Seats, which comes out in October 2017. We'll get to our interview with Charlie right after this message about a free audiobook from Audible.com. As a special offer to you, the listeners of the Jesus Calling podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Find your favorite Sarah Young titles, including Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, in an audiobook version, and get it for free by trying audible.com. Check out a small sample of the Jesus Calling audiobook featured at the end of this podcast. To download an entire free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling for your full free audiobook. Now, on to our interview with Charlie Daniels. I was five years old when Pearl Harbor was bombed. I come from Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a seacoast town. I remember it was the days before television. And I, we, my granddad had a big old full model radio, and I remember being with my family. It was a, a real gray Sunday, and I remember hearing on the radio there was a scratchy overseas broadcast talking about the Japanese Imperial Air Force had bombed our naval base in Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was much too young to grasp the gravity of the situation. I knew that something very serious had happened in my formative years were during the Second World War. Charlie has had a very successful music career spanning decades with multi-platinum selling records. Along with his musical endeavors, Charlie has recently become involved with an organization that gives help and aid to U.S. veterans. Charlie shares some scenes from his early years that have influenced where he is today and the faith that accompanied him all along the way. I was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, and uh, I had gone to first grade all of two weeks when my dad changed jobs 
and we moved to Valdosta, Georgia. Uh, I lived in North Carolina, South Carolina, in, in, in Georgia in my formative years. My dad's job kept him moving around a lot. So I went to as many as three schools in a year's time more than once. But uh, I finally landed on my feet in a little town in, called Gulf, North Carolina, which is the central part of the state. And I went to all my high school days at the school in, the, in Goldston, North Carolina. Class of 1955 had 22 graduates in it. I've always loved music. My family always loved music, although there was hardly anybody that actually played. And certainly nobody played well enough to have the patience to try to show me how to do it. As the good Lord would have it, I went up to my friend's house one day, a guy I'd been knowing for a long time. I had no idea he had a guitar. He had an old Stella guitar. The strings probably had never been changed on it. Neck about the size of half of a fence post and strings way up off the neck, but he knew about two and a half chords on it. And I said, you gotta show me that. I always wanted to know how to play it. Anyway, make a long story short, he showed me that, and then we started bugging everybody we could find that knew one more chord than we did, and just, I, I can't read music. I can learn to play completely by ear. And uh, I played guitar for a while, and then started playing a mandolin. And the fingerboard on the mandolin and the fiddle are the same. You, of course, play one with a pick and one with a bow. So somebody showed up with a fiddle one day and I had to give that a shot. So I started with it and I, one of the kids I went to school with said when I played the fiddle it sounded like somebody stepped on a cat. Because I do it all wrong. So I didn't know any better. I just did, you know, just tried to get comfortable with it and started sawing on it. I started playing when I was probably about 15 years old. And I played, uh, we played square dances and any place we'd get somebody to let us play a song for learning to play. I moved to Wilmington, back to Wilmington, North Carolina in 1956, and uh, there was a lady who was putting together a band to play in Jacksonville, North Carolina, which is the home of the 2nd Marine Division. It was one of the few places where they could have music for six nights a week. So I was working a daytime job. I used to drive 50 miles up, play, drive 50 miles back, go to work early in the morning. I moved to Nashville in 67. I was already pretty seasoned in the show business when I got here, but of course Nashville was a different, it was, a, it was a horse of a different color. It was recording and creating and that sort of thing rather than performance. Um, I moved here with a $20 bill and a clutch out of my car and a wife and a baby. <laughs> but uh, it's just one of the many stories around, you, you'll get around Nashville, we talk to people who came here. I thought I wanted to be behind the scenes. I started doing a little record production and, and, and playing some sessions and stuff like that, but actually all the time I had this burning desire to get back on stage because that's what I wanted to do. That's where my heart was. That's where my talent mostly is. My first recording contract came about in a very odd way. I was producing an act in San Francisco, a guy named Jerry Corbett. He was on Capitol Records and we were in LA one day playing some of the sides we had recorded for the brass at Capitol so they could hear what we were doing. And Jerry's manager, a guy named Donald Rubin, said, he had heard some of my songs. He said, Charlie, why don't you play some of your songs? There was a guitar there. And I picked up a guitar and started singing some of my songs. There was a guy in the room from Capitol Records. He signed me on the spot. And uh, that's what began my recording career. Of course, it was to be a while before we made much noise with records, but uh, that's how it started. It's funny how things, some of the things, some of the best things ever happened to you happen off the cuff. Things you don't plan, you don't look for, they're total surprises when they happen, but so many times I've had things happen to me like that. Charlie went on to record numerous hits and had the opportunity to share the stage with many huge musical icons while creating his niche in country music. Although he's still in the business of making music, Charlie has a couple of new passions these days as well. One of them is being involved with a nonprofit organization called the Journey Home Project. He shares what led him to get involved in this area. Wilmington played a very strategic part in the Second World War. There was, a, there was a shipyard there that built Liberty ships. There was a port there that oil tankers and cargo ships came out and went through the mouth of the Cape Fear River and over across the Atlantic Ocean to service our military over in Europe. And uh, a lot of them were sunk just, just off our coast by German U-boats that lay just off our coast, German submarines. It's said I never saw, I was too young to, to, to do that, but it said you could see the fires of battle from our beaches sometimes. It's how close the war was to us, and we took it very seriously. I learned very early in my life that 
And I say this on stage every night, only two things protect America. It's the grace of Almighty God and the United States military. It was that way in 1941, it's that way this year, next year, the year after. As long as this country remains free, it will be that. It's a part of who I am to respect and support the military. I've been among these guys. I've been in the war zones with these guys. I've seen them, they, they, they spend their time in places you don't even want to go to, where there's nothing. And they, some people seem to think for some reason or another that our military people have an extra gene that isolates them from missing their families and loneliness and that sort of thing. It's not so. They miss their families just as bad as anybody else does that's away from them. And they go and do that because they're patriots. And the least that we can do is respect and support them. So I'm there. I respect them. I support them. That's what Journey Home is all about. We try to soften the landing for our military men and women who come back from service, most of them from battle, you know, from battle areas, combat areas. And we do things like we try to help them get educated if they need education, to come back into society, to come back in and, and feel a part of it. Back during the Second World War and uh, some of the other wars we fought, people, it took two or three weeks to get home on a ship. Now you get on a plane one day, you're back to the USA. You you get off of, uh, you, you come out of a combat zone and you fly in and you, you get off and you walk out to the airport and you're on the city streets somewhere. And it's a world that's very foreign to you sometimes. And sometimes it takes a little readjustment. Some people more than others. But uh, we just try to help uh, any way we can. We're dependent on, uh, on donations and, and, you know, uh, basically events. I mean, we don't solicit particularly solicit individual donations, although we take them if somebody sends them in. We, do, we, we work hard for it. Volunteer Jam last year was a big money raiser for us. I think we did about $300,000 off of it, uh, mainly due to sponsor money and that sort of thing. We do an event at the Palm every year. Uh, uh, somebody wants to get involved and come to that and have fun at the same time. We allocate funds to the people we feel like are more deserving and where it will be put to the best use. As passionate as Charlie is about helping U.S. veterans, he is also passionate about his faith. Charlie describes how that faith sustained him through some difficult times. I like to think my faith impacts everything that I do and everything that I am. I'm writing a biography right now, and the hardest part for me to write was on my faith, was trying to express my feelings and my what I feel and what I, you know, my, my feelings, my concept of what Christianity is and what it means. And it, I had to get pretty introspective about it. It was a hard part for me to write. And I got figuring the only been one perfect human being ever born since Adam and Eve. One perfect human being without blemish, without sin, and it was Jesus Christ. So he broke the chain. It's like this is for everybody. This one shedding of blood covers your sins. You repent, you believe, and you act on it. Commit the 91st Psalm to memory. We live within the shadow of the Almighty, sheltered by the gods who are above all gods. It's a psalm of, of protection. Uh, I have I've repeated that in a, a lot of different situations. I was about 20 miles of a snowmobile trail when I had a stroke. I first of all thought it was, a, I, my left hand started going numb. I thought it was because of the, you know, the, the, the lever I was using over there. And I got the feeling it was down in my foot, it was up in my jaw, and I said, something wrong here, we need to go. And I told the people I was with us, head back down the mountain. I was able to ride a snowmobile all the way back down the mountain. Then a series of things started happening. I was in Durango, Colorado. We were on the same side of town as the hospital. We could have been 90 miles the other way. People that always hauled a snowmobile trailer had not brought one. I had two extra snowmobiles and they used my snowmobiles that day. So they, they had a car with no trailer on it. We drove in to the hospital. I went in the hospital. They gave me a TPC shot and I had about 15, 20 minutes left to do it in because it loses its effectiveness after a while. God, hospital, this side of town, God. Car without a trailer on it, God. Having this shot, when I got there, God. They put me on a helicopter, not a helicopter, an airplane, took me to Denver, to Swedish Hospital. When I got there, I found out 
the people that, uh, that uh, one of the people that worked at Swedish Hospital was uh, doing some work with the hospital in Durango. They had only had that shot in their pharmacy for about three months. God, that was laid out. I'm gonna have a stroke, but I'm gonna have it in a place where we can get back down the mountain, we can get the help we can get to. I mean, I know doctors, doctors treat, God heals. Another part of Charlie Daniels' faith experience has been the practice of reading Jesus Calling daily. Charlie remembers the day he discovered Jesus Calling, and since then, he and his wife have made it part of their everyday life. It's been several years ago, and I'll be married 52 years in September, so I am pretty seasoned into the ways of, of uh, married life. And I know when my wife goes shopping, if I go with her, the best thing for me to do is just find, take a good book or find something I want to do or look around. So anyway, we were, I think, in Flagstaff, Arizona on a day off, and she went, and I went to a bookstore, and I looked down, and there was a leather-bound book there, and that's what it was. It was Jesus Calling, and I picked it up and looked at it and went and bought it. And uh, it was, you know what's amazing about it, and I'm sure you've probably encountered this a lot as you've done these interviews, it's amazing how much the daily reading applies to something that's going on in your life at that time. And I found it to be that way, but I read it every day. I read Jesus Calling every day, and uh, my wife reads it every day. We, And I don't know how many copies we've given away. We, we keep we give them away for Christmas or, you know, get a couple of cases of them and pass them out to, to friends and people. But it's just part of my devotional every day. It's amazing how much it, I've talked to other people say the same thing. You get up in the morning, you read uh, Jesus Calling, and it's got something to do with it. Something's going on in your life, you know. It's just part of my devotion. It's part of my, my reading, what I do every morning. Charlie's legacy in music is well known, and his endeavors to help others as his faith leads him will continue to build his legacy for generations to come. Once again, Charlie. There's a scripture in the Bible for just about everything we're confronted with. But I committed the 21st Psalm to, to memory a long time ago. I've, well, I've, I've said it in my mind flying in helicopters in Iraq. I've said it in my mind anytime I feel you know, needed, I need to do it. Because he is ultimately in charge. I'm not going to say bad things don't, will not happen to you, absolutely, but you're not, it's not, you know, you're, you're in his charge. He'll take care of you. He took care of me for almost 80 years. Charlie shares a passage of Jesus Calling that has been meaningful to him. I love you regardless of how well you're performing. Sometimes you feel uneasy, wondering if you're doing enough to be worthy of my love. And no matter how exemplary your behavior, the answer to the question will always be no. Your performance and my love are totally different issues, which you need to sort out. I love you with an everlasting love that flows out from eternity without limits or conditions. I have clothed you in my robe of righteousness, and this is an eternal transaction. Nothing and no one can reverse it. Therefore, your accomplishment as a Christian has no bearing on my love for you. Even your ability to assess how well you're doing on a given day is flawed. Your limited human perspective and the condition of your body with its mercurial variations distort your evaluations. Bring your performance anxiety to me and receive it in its place, my unfailing love. Try to stay conscious of my loving presence with you in all that you do, and I will direct your steps. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, our show focuses on how we can face our fears and be authentic with the Lord's help. Our guests are Kelly Ballery, the author of Fear Fighting, and Esther Fleece, the author of No More Faking Fine. Here's a preview from our interview with Kelly Ballery. I just want everyone to know that you are not bad, or you are not a lost child, or you are not forgotten because you feel fear. Your story is special, and God is going to work through it powerfully to do a mighty, mighty work when you submit it to Him. Today's a new start, a new beginning. Just come to God and just submit it to Him. Bring it to the, the bottom of the cross. Bring it to His feet, just your heart, and, and, and hear His words for you. 
hear his heart for you, and I don't think God is going to lead you wrong. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.